I didn't know if it would be okay to wear my Union Jack dress in the UK, being a foreigner and everything. So last year, I brought it, but I didn't wear it. But everybody was so nice last year, I figured, you know, this year, you should do it. And I am doing it for a couple of reasons. First is because I love our vegan designers, our vegan companies, our vegan businesses of every type. And this is from a lovely vegan New York City designer. Her name is Lois Eastland. That's L-U-N-D if you want to look her up. She makes every single dress herself with her own little sewing machine. And yet, they're very, very reasonably priced because we're vegans, and we're so nice. But the other reason I wanted to wear my Union Jack dress is because I absolutely adore this country. Now, I know that's true of a lot of Americans, and that's because we just keep trying to measure up. I mean, when you're American, you look over here, and we see that you guys can take credit for Shakespeare, and we can take credit for the Kardashians. And um, you have a royal family, and we have Donald Trump. And so we just keep trying to be better and, and measure up. I think there's also something that we really want your approval. You know, it's sort of like in a family, we want you to like us. We kind of want to be the best people you ever colonized. You know, there, there's like a, a sibling rivalry. And we say, India, with your yoga, well, we gave the world Coca-Cola. And then we have to kind of think of the uh, comparison there. You can always tell when an American is trying to pass, because we'll say, brilliant, or cheers. Or, can you direct me to the loo, when we really know it's the bathroom, but we just would rather sound like you. So for me, my, my appreciation of this country was so vast that I moved here on my 18th birthday. The minute I was legal, I was on the plane. Icelandic Airlines, back then it wasn't regulated and it was cheaper than other airlines, so everybody on the plane was either carrying a guitar or wearing a nun's habit. But after a weekend in Reykjavik, I got here, I was gonna do this thing, and you can tell how long ago it was because my flat cost 13 pounds a week and it was in Eaton Place. So, times change, but miracles happen for me here. Several miracles. Every time I come here, something really special takes place. So, way back when, way back when I was really a kid, I had a miracle. One evening, someone that I knew said, oh, I have someone to whom to introduce you, and he took me walking through this club. It was called Bag of Nails and it was kind of big and kind of dark and kind of convoluted, and we get way to the back, and there's this really good-looking guy sitting there. And we were introduced, and he said, hello, Vicky. And I couldn't say anything, because if I were to have said something, I would have had to have said, hello, Paul McCartney. <laughs> and we were introduced, and we sat, and then he said to the waiter, Scotch and Coke, three, doubles. Well, I'd never even had a single. I, I thought, well, what if I die? And then I thought, well, I'll die with a beat a little. I'll be worth it. <laughs> so that was pretty magical. But then, even more magical and wonderful for the whole rest of my life was the fact that just as would happen for Sir Paul, while I was living here, I became vegetarian because you guys had been doing it for a long time. I mean, you had the Vegetarian Society way back in the mid-1800s, the Vegan Society from 1944. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. That is right smack in the middle of the US, and it has a steak named for it. That was the kind of place I was coming from, and then I showed up here, and you had vegetarian restaurants. Who knew such a thing could exist? totally changed my life, 
and perhaps second only to giving birth to my daughter some years later. It's the very best thing that ever happened to me. So all of you who are here today who are kind of veg curious and just looking at this or maybe wanting to take it a little bit further, do the research and see if it's for you because I'm here to tell you it's wonderful and fabulous and such an adventure. You know what happens sometimes when people go vegan? They forget that it's an adventure and they think that it's something that, that you're supposed to just give a lot of things up. So sometimes somebody will say, well, what is this thing you do, this vegan thing that you do? And we get this idea, oh, this is a live one. I'm gonna just grab him over here, you know, like the old vaudevillian with the cane, I'm gonna get this one. And so we say, well, if you're a vegan, you don't eat meat or fish or fowl. You don't eat eggs, including in dairy products. And you don't, including in baked goods, I'm sorry, you don't eat dairy products. And this includes ice cream whipped cream, heavy cream, clotted cream, butter, or cheese. You really shouldn't eat honey, and if you're an ethical vegan, then you don't wear leather, suede, fur, wool, silk, down. You don't use any cosmetics or toiletries or household products that have been tested on animals. You don't take your children to the circus or the zoo or the sea world. You lost him back at clotted cream. He's waiting for the vow of celibacy. When instead of you give up and you give up and you give up, what I have found is you just get stuff. You get all kinds of amazing ethnic cuisines that I never would have tried if I hadn't gone vegan. You also get all these wonderful fruits and vegetables. You go to the farmer's market and you find out how many vegetables come in purple. Who knew that? It's a wonderful, enlightened, and enlightening way of life. And I find every day there's, there's another layer of the onion that's peeling to make things even more exciting. So what I'm going to be talking with you about today is the look great, feel amazing, age later lifestyle. Now, I am an ethical vegan, which sounds really funny. That sounds like standing up and saying, I'm ethical, what are you? <laughs> but basically what it means is I got into this because of the animals. It's fabulous that it's so healthy. I love it that it is so health promoting. That's not why I did it. And yet what's so interesting to me is that you start to do something for somebody else, just like they said in the film, who was here for Cowspiracy? When, when the person said, I no longer eat for myself, I eat for others, but because of this wonderful kind of law of karma in the universe, what goes around comes around, and what you do comes back to you. And so you start to do this for the benefit of somebody else, and you get all these amazing benefits for yourself as well. That's why I call my latest book The Good Karma Diet. So before I get into this MEND program that the introducer mentioned for you, I want to tell you a little bit about myself for those of you that uh, were not acquainted yet. So my name is Victoria Moran, and I'm the author of 12 books. My first book was actually my college thesis. It was called Compassion, the Ultimate Ethic, and it was published right here in the UK by a company called Thorson's back in 1985. Now, at that time, it was the first book about vegan philosophy and practice ever to come from a freestanding publisher. But at that time, almost nobody cared. I mean, my mother bought several copies. It wasn't exactly a worldwide bestseller, but it did get me started. And there have been 11 other titles since. I wrote a couple more vegan-type books, and then I thought, well, I've said everything I have to say about that. And so I went back to my, my college degree, which was comparative religions, and I started writing books about spirituality, which was a really cool thing to do in the 1990s, because that was kind of the time when we had Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra, and everybody was out there. And it was pretty cool, because I got myself on Oprah twice. And that was really fun. She's such a master of what she does. 
I was on there talking about inner beauty and living in a way that brings out your inner beauty and accepting yourself for who you are, what you are, how you look, your body type, everything about you. And I told the story of a friend of mine who by Western standards would be considered obese. But she visited India and people were coming up to her and saying, you're so beautiful. You're so fat and so beautiful, I try to be fat. What do you do? And Oprah, the master of the pregnant pause, just kind of waited. And then she said, can't wait to go to India. So that was a pretty cool experience. And then I was going on in that world, still being vegan, raised my daughter vegan. She grew up and she has become a stunt performer. So no vegan wimps around here. Do you guys get the TV show Gotham? It's about Batman before he was Batman. She's a stunt double for the young Batman. But even though I was living vegan, I wasn't working vegan. And I was all ready to write another spirituality kind of self-help book. And I went in December of 2010 to a PETA fundraiser. And they showed film, like we've been showing films here today. And you know, if you're in this world, you've seen the footage. You've seen the stuff that humans do to animals and you get to the point where it's like, okay, I've done that, I've had enough, no more. But for some reason, that particular night, my heart was really open. And I saw those images and all I wanted to do was write PETA a check for $100,000, except the check would have bounced. So. I had to do something else, and I didn't know what. So I got in, in the subway to go home there in New York City, and I started talking to God. And I said, all I want to do is help. What can I do to help? And God said, well, here's what you can do. Uh, you can write a book, and you can call it Main Street Vegan. You've got the high street over here. In the States, we have Main Street, and that just means kind of ordinary, everyday people. And it needs to be 40 little chapters, and it needs to have the recipe at the end of each one, because everybody really likes recipes these days. And you need to gear it to that young woman that you were so long ago, living in the Midwest of the United States. You're vegetarian, hard to be vegan, because it seems so weird, and it seems so extreme, and it seems so far out. Write to her. And I called my agent the next morning and said, scrap the self-help book, we're doing Main Street Vegan. And even though we were on a regular phone and I couldn't see what she was doing, she was rolling her eyes. I know, she was rolling her eyes. But Main Street Vegan has done really well around the world. It spawned a weekly podcast. I have bookmarks about that if you're interested. Does anybody listen? The Main Street Vegan Podcast, yay! It's so cool, the miracle of podcasting that you can talk to people around the world. And also, I have a training program in New York City, Main Street Vegan Academy, which trains vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So we just finished our 14th class. We have 200 graduates from around the world, and there was one in this past class who's only 18 years old. She's like our youngest student ever. And she's a student at New York University, but she's actually from Saudi Arabia. And her plan is to go back and start PETA Saudi. Now, if that doesn't take a lot of courage, and everybody's story is so wonderful, and I know everybody in this room, whether you're vegan, vegetarian, veg curious, you have a story, and your story is growing and expanding, and we're all part of this incredible ripple effect to change the world. And so, <clears throat> one way that we're gonna do it is to take incredibly good care of ourselves, because we have work to do, and it's important. And as the L'Oreal people say, you're worth it. Now, we live in a culture, I think in the whole Western world, where youth is celebrated and age is not trusted. And I don't think it's quite as bad over here. And the reason I say that is because when I watch television in the UK, a lot of the actors look like humans. And in the States, they all look like the spawn of Barbie and Ken 
I mean, even the newscasters. I was watching one just before I came here, and she was relating various stories of news from around the world, and I realized only her lips are moving. Nothing else moves. It was really, really odd. Went to LA a few months ago and said to my daughter, can I bring you back anything from LA? And she said, what do you mean, like some Botox? So we have a lot of that stuff going on over here. I didn't know if you did or not, but last night I went into Boots, and speaking of L'Oreal, I see they've got this line for older women, and it's called Age Defense, and I saw that. I mean, defense? I mean, that's like what you need if somebody is coming at you in an alleyway with a weapon. Very interesting to me, you know, we gotta defend ourselves. But you know, when you think about it, you go to the Chinese restaurant, and they have all these lovely names for the dishes. So what do you want to order? Long life and happiness. Not short life with dermal fillers. I mean, it's just, it's a much better life when you can just kind of accept that with the passage of time, things can really just keep getting better. And that is what I have found happens living as a vegan and with this amazing, commitment to something bigger than me. So let's talk about the MEND program. I love acronyms. If you come tomorrow on Activism Day, I'll have an acronym for AHIMSA, harmlessness. But today, I want to give you my MEND acronym. So here's the question. What if you could mend your ways? What if you could just hit the delete key on every late night and every extra sticky bun, and every extra pint of Guinness, and every extra rasher of bacon that you ever consumed in your entire life, anything that you ever did that the next morning you were thinking, wish I hadn't done that. Well, there actually is a way, and that is this MEND program, which stands for Meditation, Exercise, Nourishment, and Detoxification. So we're gonna go through that because that's your your instruction list for how you're going to ace the aging project process, feel fabulous every day of your life, and have all sorts of energy to get out there and save animals, save the planet, and save the world. Sound good? So, meditation. Who does it? Who's a meditator? Okay, so who's like really a meditator, like you really do it every single day and not, well, I did it once in 1992 and I liked it. Okay, because it's very easy to kind of not do, and what really makes it work is consistency. And I can say this because I travel a lot, and a lot of things happen when you travel, like you get out of some of your really good habits, and you also start drinking coffee, at least that's what I do when I get jet lagged. But meditation, if you can carry it through your life on a pretty regular basis, does something miraculous. It connects your mind and your body, and it heals them both. So when you think about just sitting, just sitting a bit, what do you think? Do you think boring, or do you think, I don't want to do that, because what thoughts could come up? It takes a whole lot of courage. You know, there are a lot of things in life that take courage, and you wouldn't think that just sitting still and breathing was one of them. But it really is, because we live in very crowded kinds of cultures, very noisy kinds of cultures. So in the Buddhist tradition, they actually call meditation sitting. And it's the weirdest thing, because in most of the West, we sit quite a bit. I mean, with the advent of the computer, my God, you can have a really interesting life. You can go shopping and meet people and date and be entertained and learn, learn things, have access to the libraries of the world, and never get up. And yet, when you think about the word sitting, it just seems like it's not very important or very active. If you call somebody and said, what are you doing? And they say, well, I'm just sitting. You'd probably think, well, I'm the superior being. I've been doing all kinds of things. And yet, sometimes, you just need to sit. And the times for doing that in, in the most uh, appropriate ways are first thing in the morning, and then again, after work, before dinner, that kind of time of the day when we tend to get the lull. And 
if you do this, you get this beautiful second wind, and you're given the evening back. So how do you do it? It's not hard. You just sit. So you're sitting, and you're watching your breath. We're going to have some meditation workshops here at the festival. They'll teach you all the fine points. So you're watching your breath, or maybe you're using a mantra. Maybe you're using a Sanskrit word, or maybe a lovely English phrase. I like, all is well, because that's kind of an affirmation and a mantra. And I inhale, all is, and I exhale, well. And then my conscious mind says, no, it's not. Your life is not all that perfect. All is well. Didn't you watch the news last night? Everything is going to hell in a handbasket. All is well. And after a while, you kind of start to believe it in spite of yourself. And then thoughts come. And people think, I'm doing it wrong. I had a thought. Well, of course you're going to have a thought, because it's the nature of the mind to think. And so what you want to do is remember what St. Francis said. He said it's perfectly normal for thoughts to come into your head during meditation. It's like having a bird flying around your head. You just don't want to invite this bird to build its nest in your hair. So you're meditating, and you're going along, and you're thinking, oh gosh, I forgot to buy almond butter. You know, I've been forgetting a lot of things lately. I wonder if I'm starting to lose my mind. Oh gosh, I should do more with that Lumosity app that I am paying for every single year. And you go, and you go, and you go. All you have to do at any point is just bring it back. There's no way to do it wrong. So somehow you get from the almond butter to the dotage, and you just bring it back. All is well. All is well. And then what happens? Well, you find that you are calmer and more peaceful. And that when people say things to you like, but where do you get your protein? Instead of saying, can't you come up with a more creative question? You actually know that that's the very same question we all had. And you say, that is a really interesting question. And I'm glad you asked that, because protein is important. I mean, it's so important that nature put it in everything that grows up out of the ground. In fact, there is a physician in Santa Rosa, California, John McDougall, way back in 1984, he put $10,000 in the bank for any nutritionist, dietitian, or physician who could come up with a diet based on whole plant foods that was deficient in protein. That money is still sitting there. Maybe you could figure out how to get it. Or you could even just say to that question, good question, where do you think I get it? He who asks the question owns the conversation. And if you're upright and healthy and doing well, you obviously get it somewhere. And you can embrace that question. And you can even embrace the questions that are a little bit hostile. Don't you love the hypotheticals? But what would you do if you were on a desert island and there was a rabbit? <laughs> well, I guess I think, what has the rabbit been eating? <laughs> Probably the rabbit is skinnier than I am. So um, you come to have more of an understanding. Y you open your heart a little bit more. You also find that the place where you meditate gets just a little cozier. People who meditate in their bedrooms tend to have better marriages. It's like interior, interior design. And then, of course, what was said in the introduction, you get healthier. There's been so much research done on meditation since the 1970s. My favorite was the one that she quoted, that people who meditate regularly for five years or more are 12 years younger physiologically. So everybody, do a little math. Subtract 12 from your chronological age. That's going to put some of you back in elementary school. But whatever your current chronological age, subtracting 12 years is quite a lot. 
You stop smoking, they say you can get seven years back. You sit quietly for 20 minutes twice a day, you get 12. Now, what do they mean by physiological aging? They looked at cholesterol, HDL and LDL, blood pressure, body mass index, joint flexibility, hearing, vision, all the things that kind of go south over time. And the people who meditated did better by a dozen years. Is it worth a try? 30 days, who can commit to 30 days? 30 days, morning, early evening, 30 days just morning, trying to get somebody. Okay, you know, meatless Monday, meditation Monday, can we do meditation Monday? Okay, all right, I won't make it as an auctioneer. So that's M in the, M in the MEND program. And the second letter is E, which is for exercise, and I really wish it weren't. But that is an acronym within an acronym, because that's me. So think of it this way. You take care of me in the morning, and then you can take care of everybody else all day long. So I didn't like exercise as a kid, didn't like to sweat. I was the fat kid, and this was back when kids weren't overweight. I mean, there was me, and then there was the other kid in school somewhere. We were always best friends. It was not the world's best way to grow up, especially because my dad was a diet doctor. Oh, terrible, terrible karma. And my mother worked in kind of the exercise world, but it was before people got into exercise, so they called them reducing salons. And you can still see them in some of these old commercials. There were these belts and rollers, and you'd hook yourself in, and you'd do this. The idea being that if you were jostled sufficiently and with enough intent, great chunks of yourself would float off into the stratosphere, never to be seen or heard from again. Didn't work for me. I was a fat kid. I was bad for business. So the whole idea of exercise never really made me happy, and yet, I've tolerated it. I've done what we're supposed to do. It's helped me to kind of see a metaphysical, metaphorical underside of exercise. So for example, what's the first kind of exercise we need to do? Cardio, aerobic exercise, you know, you're on the treadmill, you're out running, you're biking, you do it. I just despise it. Now I must say, since we have all these wonderful vegan podcasts, that does help. Because if I'm listening to an interesting enough program, I forget that I am on the ridiculous treadmill. It also helps to know that there is a metaphysical and metaphorical underside to cardiovascular exercise, and that is endurance. It's also sometimes called endurance exercise, and it takes endurance to get through life. So if I can make it to 45 minutes on the treadmill, chances are I can endure just about anything. What's another kind of exercise we need? Hint, Patrick Baboumian. Weightlifting strength training. Yeah, because this is what's going to actually change the makeup of your body. Have you heard this awful phrase, is skinny fat? That means you look thin, but you're really fat inside. There, there is this fat around your organ. I mean, it's just really terrible because it's bad enough that everybody says, oh, I feel so terrible, I feel fat, and now even the skinny people have to feel fat. That's our culture. But <laughs> when you do weightlifting, everything fixes itself. You change the structure of your physical body. Now, I've always despised weightlifting the least, of all the kinds of exercise, and it helps me a lot to have inspiration. Pat Reeves, I think she's here this weekend, she's this fabulous grandmother here, here in the UK who is a power lifter, and not only that, she's a cancer survivor, and not only that, she's a raw food vegan. How can this happen? Well, it does. And there's also a metaphysical, metaphorical underside to strength training, and that is it gives you strength for life. You know, it takes courage sometimes to go out there and be human, especially if you've decided to be a voluntary minority, 
to be a vegetarian or a vegan, animal rights person. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to stand up to people who disagree with you and who'll tell you so. When I was doing a lot with weight training and I was also taking some self-defense classes, one day I was driving, my daughter was in the other seat, and I looked out and this man was punching this woman on the sidewalk. I mean, he was really beating her up and everybody else was just watching. And I thought, oh my goodness, somebody has to help this woman. Who can help her? I guess I can help her. So I said to my daughter, stay here. I get out of the car, I walk up to this couple, and I didn't realize from the car, this man was gargantuan. Well, I said to him, at the top of my lungs, cut it out. And for the first time ever in my life, I saw speechless. He goes, he couldn't say anything because I look like this and he looks like Goliath and none of those other people would stand up to him, but I did. Now, the other part of the story, kind of sad, is that the woman got up on her tiptoes and <laughs> kissed him. And I thought, oops, it's one of those domestic things. Well, I did my bit, got back in the car, and in my fantasy, one day, she got her act together and she left this bully because I got out of my car and stood up to him. And not only that, all those other people saw too. Why was that? Because I'd been working out because I didn't feel like this little puny person that I am, because I felt like a person with power. That's what happens when you lift. So lift, and then what happens? What's another kind of exercise that we need? That's all good, that's all good. I'm thinking more like yoga, flexibility, stretching, now, this is important to prevent injury. It's important to help you stay young. In yoga, they say you are as young as your spine. But there's also a metaphysical, metaphorical underpinning of flexibility. And that is, you need to be flexible for life, especially if you live with other humans or you work with other humans, or heaven forbid, if you're a vegetarian or vegan and you eat with other humans. Sometimes you've just gotta be flexible and just let them do what you do. God, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I just won't inhale and smell what they're eating because I know that one day I ate that. Very few of us were born vegan. So as you're striving for this flexibility, Think about how the body and the mind are so connected. So at night, if you can put out your yoga mat and just get down and few, few simple stretches, no big deal, just a little something maybe while you're watching television, then leave your yoga mat out. And then first thing in the morning, there it'll be. And you'll do a few more stretches. Now I learned about this underside of flexibility at an Ikea store. You guys have Ikea? Over here, you know you're supposed to put the furniture together with this little thing that looks like an L, which is absolutely impossible, but anyway. So I went to Ikea, and I bought a bunch of stuff, and it actually was able to, to be put together, but I'd also bought a desk, and it came in 8,000 pieces. I couldn't put it together. My husband couldn't put it together. The superintendent of our building couldn't put it together. Now, because I live in Manhattan and we don't have an Ikea, I had to hire somebody to get to New Jersey to make this purchase. He was called Schmuck with a Truck. And so I had to call him back to go back to New Jersey. He wasn't cheap. And I'm sitting there in the truck thinking 8,000 pieces. Nobody said this would come in 8,000 pieces. And I get there, and I'm standing in the take-back line, 
and everybody is just as upset with the situation as I am, and everyone is very, 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 very tense. <laughs> Except one young woman, and I could tell that she had done ballet as a child because she had one foot facing east and one foot facing west, and it didn't even look uncomfortable, and she was going. <laughs> and it looked kind of funny there in the take back line at Ikea, but she was the only person who wasn't doing an impression of Quasimodo. She was taking this time to stretch her body and be flexible in her mind. So when people at work annoy you, get somewhere and just stretch a little bit. It's all good. M-E, me in the morning. Meditation, exercise. And then you'll feel much more like moving on in the MEND program to N for nourishment. So I used to say nutrition, but nutrition sounds like bottles of pills, and that's not it. It's the idea of being nourished with every aspect of life. So we're nourished not just by food, but we're nourished by people that we love and beautiful scenery and doing things you really, really like. You know, I told you I never really liked exercise. I finally found one that I like six months ago. Pray that you don't have to wait that long. But what I discovered was aerial yoga. It means I get to fly. I love it. And it nourishes me. Does anybody do aerial yoga? Is anybody? Well, I'm going to do it tomorrow morning and Monday and Tuesday evening in Whitechapel Road. So if anybody wants to join me, let me know because it is just so much fun. They hang this, this fabric and you kind of do all the yoga hanging upside down, which makes the world look right side up. It's quite, quite stunning. So that's a kind of nourishment. But the kind of nourishment that we're about here today so much, especially if you look at the stalls, you'd think that vegans thought of nothing other than eating, which some days is almost true. But you want to be nourished with this beautiful, high vibration kind of food. Now, there are all kinds of ways to be a healthy vegan. This isn't like some kind of cult where everybody eats the same thing. You know, call up the leader and find out what he's eating today. No, there are people who have recovered from heart disease on a completely oil-free diet. There are raw food vegans. There are macrobiotic vegans, and they cook everything. There is just every sort of way. And for me, I eat very seasonally. So sometimes in the summer, I start to think I'm a raw fooder because I'm eating all this raw food. And people say, what do you eat? And I say, well, I eat raw food. And then the very first cool breeze of autumn, soup, oatmeal. I'm not a raw fooder. But it all kind of cycles, and it just works. And whatever you find for yourself is going to work too, because this is not a diet. Not a diet. The most beautiful wedding I ever attended long, long time ago, the officiant said, we are here today to talk about love. And love is not an emotion, because God is love, and God is not an emotion. That stuck with me. And I think about it with this vegan way of living. This is not a diet. No diet is going to change the world. This is a revolution. It's a transformation. So it's a, it's a lifestyle. That's right. When people go through Main Street Vegan Academy, we train them and certify them as vegan lifestyle coaches and educators because it has to do with every aspect of life. And that's what makes it so fun and interesting because if you're into food, oh my goodness, you can do all sorts of things with food or health or fashion or beauty or athletics. It's everywhere. And of course, 
environmentalism, and animal rights. So let's nourish ourselves splendidly. Let's eat food that is as beautiful as you yourself have ever wished to be. So you want to have food that's really colorful. There was a really bad time in, in my life. Some time ago, I was a young widow. I didn't know what I was doing. And I decided that I should move to the country, that that would be a simple life. Of course, I didn't know anything about living in the country, so it didn't seem all that simple. But the very first night, I went to the supermarket and got all my lovely vegan food. And the clerk from the southern United States stopped the belt. She looked at my food, and she looked at me, and she said, I've had this job near 15 years, and I've never seen such pretty groceries. I had pretty groceries. Pretty groceries make pretty people. So you want to have beautiful, fresh, live, vibrant kinds of food. There's a wonderful doctor in Minneapolis. His name is Adiel Tel Oren. And he says, when people say, but what do you eat? Here's what he tells them. He says, I want you every day to have a great big salad. Now, I get my salad bowls at a restaurant supply house because regular stores don't know what a high raw vegan's salad is like. It is one whopping salad. And then, you gotta make it not like salad. Have you ever had anybody say, oh, you're a vegan, you must eat a lot of salad. And then they get that look that you can tell they feel sorry for you. But it's not a punitive salad, it's a celebrational salad. So along with all your interesting greens and all your purple veggies, you're gonna put some steamed yams and some sauteed broccoli and some wonderful beans and some sunflower seeds and some chia seeds and some hemp seeds. I mean, you're gonna go crazy with your salad. Why not? Life's too short to have a boring salad. And then says Dr. T, in addition to your salad every day, I want you to have at least a cup of dark leafy greens. So we're talking about the, the kale, the collards. I never ate that food. I didn't know what to do with it. I remember when I first heard of it though, I was a little girl and I went into my dad's private office because I wanted to fix myself. I wanted to lose weight and be a better person. So I climbed up on this chair and pulled down this big book and it was called Alimentaris Humanus. And I don't know how I knew that that was a nutrition book, but somehow I did. And I opened this book, it was all dusty. I don't think he looked at it since, I don't know, 1935. And I'm going through and it's all chemistry, I don't know what it's about. And then I get to this page where it has food by nutrient density. And they have something like that now at Whole Foods Market, they call it the Andy score, where it shows you how much bang per calorie you get, how much nutrient you know in each food. But this was in my dad's ancient medical book. And there was all this weird food at the top of the chart. It was things like collard greens. I didn't know what that was. And then there was calé. Okay, I figured that was French. And then there was Swiss chard. Well, okay, that's Swiss. No wonder I don't know about that. And arugula, okay, that's Italian. And I'm going on and on and on. I'd never heard of any of these foods until I got down to spinach, which I had had from a can like Popeye. And when I told my mother that I had discovered the healthiest foods, she just kind of blew me off because those foods didn't seem like the better living through chemistry kinds of foods that at that time people thought were good to eat. But the dark leafy green, says Dr. T, you really need those every day. And also a serving of cabbage family vegetables or cruciferous vegetables. Now kale being miraculous is a dark leafy green and a cabbage family vegetable. But there are others as well, um, cauliflower, uh, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, because there's a specific phytochemical, a specific disease-preventing substance in those cruciferous vegetables that you just can't find any place else. So not necessarily every day, but four or five days a week, good idea, he says, to have one of those. And then, in addition, have a cup of some kind of beans. And if you're a raw fooder, you can sprout those. Otherwise, you can do beans on toast, you can do 
chili, you can do bean burgers, just put beans in your salad, it doesn't matter. Beans are miraculous. First off, they're cheap. Does anybody ever say, I could be vegan, but it costs a lot? You know, it costs a lot if you're, the basis of your diet is raw nut butter that comes in a little jar about this big and costs a week's salary. But it doesn't have to be like that. Beans are not only cheap, but they swell up, and you actually get more than you paid for. They also have amazing protein and amazing fiber, and they have a kind of fiber that many studies have shown helps people lose weight. So what's not to love? Well, gas, of course. Well, eat a little bit. If you have trouble digesting beans, eat a bean. See how you do with a bean. Then see how you do with two beans. And cook them well and eat them slowly. And the next day you can have three beans. We've all heard of a three bean salad. Well, this is literally a three bean salad. Uh, lentils and uh, split mung dal digest very well. So have your beans, says Dr. T. And in addition, he says, I'd like you to have some kind of grain. Again, sprout it if you're raw, or just any which way if, if you cook, some kind of wonderful whole grain. And so many people say, I would be vegan, but I can't have gluten. That's fine. You don't have to have gluten. You don't have to have soy. You don't have to have anything, because the plant kingdom is so vast that anything you don't like, anything that doesn't agree with you, anything that you're allergic to, or anything you even think might not be good for you because the person down in accounting in your office stopped eating it and she felt better, it doesn't matter. It's okay. You don't have to eat anything because there is plenty to eat. Some kind of grain, says Dr. T. And then he says, I'd like you to have a beautiful fruit salad just all kinds of colorful fruits in season. We know the berries are miraculous in terms of aging slowly. Blueberries, according to the Academy of Medicine at the US National Institutes of Health, they say one cup a day can prevent Alzheimer's even in people who have the Alzheimer's gene. Quite amazing stuff. Now, some of the berries, we're told, are superfoods. And you know what that means? That they come from far away, and chances are I'm selling them multi-level. That can kind of make something seem super. But the fact is, it doesn't have to come from far away. It doesn't have to be exotic. Berries and colorful, colorful fruits of all kinds are all superfoods. And then says Dr. T, if you want some more fruit, have some more fruit, and then have some nuts. You know, just a couple tablespoons if you're a small person and not active, but if you're an athlete, if you're a large person, have a third of a cup. A, a, somebody like Patrick Baboumi, and my God, he could probably eat an almond tree and do just fine. It's interesting that the only food that has ever been shown to actually relate to people living longer is nuts and seeds. People who eat nuts and seeds live longer than people who don't, all other things being equal. Plus, they're really good. Some people say, well, I can't stop. They're too good. I overeat. Well, walnuts, interestingly enough, not only have the omega-3 fatty acids, but they also have a shutoff valve. You just can't overeat walnuts unless you mix them with raisins, which, of course, then stretches out the wonderfulness of them. But just plain old walnuts, you're not going to overeat because they do have that shut-off shut valve built in. Now, you want to enjoy your food, and you want to nourish yourself on so many levels. So I can't possibly leave the subject of food without talking about the favorite, at least female, food group, and that would be the chocolate group. Now, here is the truth about chocolate. Chocolate is like sex. It can go all the way from a spiritual experience to a criminal act. <laughs> this chocolate up here is a special chocolate. This chocolate, it's the kind you buy when you're paying for gas and you eat it in the car on the way home and put the wrappers under the seats and figure you'll clean them out before somebody else finds them. You deserve such better chocolate. 
And here at the festival, there are lots of places to try it. This chocolate is vegan. That means it's dark. And even if you're someone who is fine with having dairy products at this point in your life, you don't want to have milk chocolate, and you don't want to drink cow's milk with chocolate, because that interferes with the action of the antioxidants that are in the cacao. So you want to have your wonderful vegan dark chocolate, and when you bring it home, you want to put it on that lovely little saucer that you inherited from your great-grandmother. And you want to make some tea with actual leaves. Put on some Mozart, and you sit down with your glorious little piece of chocolate, and you say, mmm, I'm worth it, because you are. Mend, M-E-N-D. Now we're to detox. Detox is such a buzzword. Do you know anybody who's always detoxing? I'm detoxing, I'm detoxing, I'm detoxing coffee this week. I'm on a juice cleanse, I'm detoxing, I'm detoxing. Well, what does that really mean? Well, it means lowering the level of toxins that are in the body. But how'd they get there? Well, they got there by living in 2015. We live in a very chemicalized time of history. And so one of the best ways to detox is just not to retox. So that means you want to eat organically, ideally veganically, when you can get a hold of something like that. You want to clear out the toxic waste dump under your sink. Do you know most of the stuff that people use to clean their houses can make you sick, not to mention that a lot of it was tested on animals. You walk down that aisle in the supermarket and just inhale. And if somebody is chemically sensitive, they'll get sick. And that stuff is all tightened and, and closed up. So you want to get rid of that, bring in the natural kind of stuff, which is also cruelty-free, or you could even make your own. You can clean practically your whole house with baking soda, um, club soda, and white vinegar. Saves all kinds of money. The same thing, the stuff you put on your skin. You want it to be non-toxic because it goes inside. They have this patch that people use to stop smoking. They put it on their skin, but the nicotine goes in them and helps them stop smoking. Well, all those chemicals go in your skin as well. So you want to eat clean. And then if you want to help your body detox, you can do all sorts of fun little things. You can get a little silver tongue scraper at the health food store, and in the morning, just very gently kind of scrape that little sweater off your tongue. In Ayurvedic medicine, they call that ama, metabolic debris. And if you've ever fasted or juice fasted, you know that stuff just gets thick and furry on your tongue. So you get rid of that in the morning. And then you also want to do dry skin brushing before you get in the bath. It's a way to get rid of the dry skin cells so your biggest organ of elimination, your skin, can do its job properly. You want to take such good care of yourself in every way. And then as time passes and you get to be old, you'll still be happy and you'll still be healthy and you'll still have some spunk about you because that's really what it's all about. A few weeks ago, I was at a train station in New York City trying to get to an airport to go speak for the Toronto Veg Fest, and there was this adorable young woman selling the tickets. She was so cute. She had beautiful, thick, dark hair. She had this little tiny waist, this nice flat tummy, these nice little perky boobs. And I said to her, I'd like the senior discount. She said, you have to be 62. I said, oh, I'm 65, but I'm vegan. We don't show our age. She said, whatever. <laughs> Gave me my ticket. But today is whatever. 30 years from now, she's going to wake up one morning, and she's going to see that those little perky breasts are down a bit. She's going to realize that there was invasion of the body snatchers in her bedroom, that somebody came in the night and took her flat tummy and turned it around, and her little round back is now in the front, and her little flat front is now in the back, and she is going to know that this beautiful, thick, wavy hair is not as thick as it once was. 
and that the gods of youth may no longer be blessing her. And she will remember that day, back in 2015, that woman to whom she sold a ticket who said, if you're vegan, it's not so bad. I may be in my grave, but I'll still be saving animals. And that's really what it's about. If you're vegan, nothing is so bad because everything is so magnificent. We're changing the world for animals. We're living a good karma life. What goes around comes around. Health, happiness, prosperity, fulfillment, it's all there. This is a magnificent way to live. Thank you all for being part of it. Thank you.